Greetings to you and welcome to vlog 12 inspiration and motivation. My name is Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University but as you can see I'm not alone this week. We're on a road trip. We've moved the vlog to a very special part of this university, which I'm going to tell you about in one second. Today, we've moved to the National Centre for Groundwater Research and Training, and we're talking to Professor Craig Simmons. Now, there's many reasons that I'm talking to Craig today. He was one of the first people that contacted me at Flinders University. He's becoming a very dear friend of mine. He's an inspirational and aspirational man. And why I wanted to talk to him today is because I think Craig is a reminder to all of us. What I want for you as PhD students is every single day I want you to wake up and be your best self. And Craig's career provides a really great example of how to be that best self every mm. single day. So Craig is going to talk to us today about research, about motivation, and in many ways about the future of doctoral education in our university. So Craig was the 2015 South Australian Scientist of the Year. Wow. He's a fellow of the Australian Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering and he received the 2011 award for Flinders Researcher of the Year. I think that's right, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. are amazing and that's just a small list of all the incredible things that this man has done through a very short career because you're still a very young man. Oh, I hope so. Thanks, Tara, and thanks for, for having me on your vlog. I'm really excited to be oh, here. I couldn't have a better sort of first friend in these vlogs, and I'm thrilled, Craig. Uh, we couldn't have a better person involved today. And the reason why I wanted to start with you mm. as the first guest is you're a very rare and special scholar, particularly these days because you are a Flinders graduate. You completed your PhD at Flinders in 1997, that's, I think. That's right. And then you went on to an academic career in Flinders and you've stayed here, mm -hmm. which is a remarkable trajectory these days. So what were your motivations to start that PhD? Oh, look, so um, for me, um, I've always been excited by research and, and teaching, but it's, you know, at a younger age, I, uh, yeah, just loved um, learning about the world and, and, and how it works. And um, I know when I was a kid, I used to um, always pester almost my parents with, why does it work that way? How does this work? And, and, um, and, and all of that. So I think in, in many respects, some of my earliest memories were about wanting to, to actually be a teacher, firstly. Oh, fantastic. Um, and then I went on to do engineering. Um, electrical and electronic engineering You're a sparky. actually wow. so, yeah, to start with and then um, physics theoretical and experimental physics and um, in some ways uh, it was a little bit fortuitous although I have to confess that by the time I was in the university I was uh, sitting in lectures um, wanting to know how I could be one of the professors in the lecture theatre, the sense of being able to do that and and to teach and learn and, and I think we've got the most amazing opportunities and I, I almost can't call it a job. Yeah. Um, but so um, that was sort of where it had come from and then I um, had uh, one day I was looking in the newspaper, it was in the advertisement one Saturday morning and there was a, a, an advert for CSIRO. Um, was formerly the Division of Water Resources, but the old Centre for Groundwater Studies and yeah. PhDs and Masters and all of these opportunities. And um, I put in an application and um, it turned out that that was um, a little bit serendipitous. But I remember driving and thinking, gosh, I'd really love to do a PhD and to do it at CSIRO because that was one of the great water groups Absolutely. in Australia, but internationally. Absolutely. So it was a great place to grow up. Uh, in research. It turned out that that um, CSIRO had and still has strong, very strong connections with Flinders. We do. So um, so there was an opportunity there. Um, I was interviewed um, for a traineeship, but I was asked if I'd like to do a PhD. And I said, wow, how, how cool would this be? And <laughs> um, so I applied for a scholarship, got a scholarship, and the rest is history. So, um, and I had the best time really. Uh, oh. I won't say it was all easy because it was not. It was often very challenging but yeah. the opportunity to do that PhD, I had no idea just how many doors and opportunities that was going to open for me. If only I'd known. I would have been 
a hundred times as excited. I was already way excited as it was. But I think what, what that story also, I hadn't heard you tell that story before. What that story conveys, Craig, so much is when an opportunity comes, say yes. Uh, I always, yeah, that, one of the challenges I have is I always say yes, I struggle to say no. So I'm always like, wow, how can, that sounds exciting, let's do it, Can let's try it out. And, and uh, yeah, so um, I, I, that was definitely um, a big changing point for me, that yeah. opportunity. And uh, as it turns out, then, so moving into, uh, to, to, to Flinders, the uh, university had decided it was probably around 96 or 97 that, uh, that they'd set up um, some groundwater academic positions. And it, I was actually a student representative on one of those. Um, so, and, uh, and then, I, then a third one came up, and uh, I actually at that point thought, well, it was a level A position. And I thought, man, I might even have a chance at a level A. So I declared that I would be applying for one of the, the ones that were coming up and, and did so. And That is amazing. Yeah, so and it is interesting, both you and I started as a, as a level A lecturer. I so started at level A. We started yep. right the way yep. through. So that's a, fa that's a fascinating story and I hope, yeah. again, aspirational for the guys and gals watching this. And the reason why I think we particularly wanted to have this session this week, Craig, is a lot of the emails I get involve students expressing a lot of apprehension about the future, you know, the worry post-PhD. Mm -hmm. So what advice would you recommend in terms of managing the relationship between the PhD and the post-PhD career? Yeah, it's a really, um, gosh, the apprehension oh, yeah. is there and it's always there yeah. in a way because like, you're constantly thinking about what next where do you go? But of course, it's a massive step, isn't it, to to go into a PhD? That's a massive. That's a big thing. And of time, and of commitment, of commitment, uh, energy, family, family. family yeah. uh, everyone's involved. It's not just just you and the relationships that you have with your supervisors and and mentors. But I think that you know, and I'd love to say that I was highly strategic about these things, Tara, but, you know, and you can reinvent history yeah. once you look back at it with the perfect sort of 20, 20 <laughs> hindsight, and say so it was all strategic, but in fact, in most cases, it was not, and, um, and I, have, I started my PhD when I was about 21, so I was really, really young. Um, gosh, uh, I was learning a lot uh, at the time and I'm still learning a lot today and I know that that will continue until I part the planet really yeah, it's yeah. long going never stop Life so um, but I think that uh, I think that one of the things that's really important now is to think about potential career pathways yeah. for PhDs and well, without getting into the exact numbers there's a number of reports out there now aren't there yes. about the trajectories post PhD and the, the amazing variation of why people do PhDs, the motivations. Indeed. Not everyone's doing it for the same reason. No. Um, and that's a good thing. Absolutely. Um, and there's so many different career pathways that you can go on to. And I think that one of the things that perhaps that I wasn't ready for was um, I was pretty clear that I wanted to be an academic. Yeah. Um, but then I also was quite realistic and pragmatic about the fact that the number of those jobs around, both in Australia and internationally, let alone in groundwater hydrology, <laughs> are few and far between. So, gee, I mean, what's yeah. the likelihood that that... I was, there was a strong element of luck that the openings came up yeah. just at the right time. Yeah. Um, but but I, you've also got to back yourself too. You've got to back yourself that when the door opens that you'll walk through it. I'm a firm believer in keeping doors as many of them open as possible, not shutting any prematurely unless you absolutely have to. Uh, planting as many seeds, knowing some yeah. will grow and, and many won't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and all of that. So, um, but I think that one of the things, and we've talked about this, haven't we, mm. already, the, the idea that there are many trajectories um, that many people do get into academic jobs, many don't. Yeah. And there's a whole raft of pathways, all of them are equally exciting yeah. and important and interesting. That's right. Um, how do we make sure that we're career ready? Um, so preparing CVs, yeah. um, getting good at public speaking, communication, yeah. science communication, research communication. Huge. Huge. Um, yeah, all of those other, uh, those um, professional development skills. Understanding consultancy, for example. Consultancy, private sector, yeah. industry, government. And, and so 
it's a, a really fascinating array of possibilities. Yeah. Um, I'm not convinced that at this point we're canvassing and preparing students um, for all of those and of course it may be really impossible to prepare for everything all at once yeah. but perhaps um, those conversations through mentoring and professional development yeah. would allow us to sort of start to target and tailor yeah. almost a, um, a personalised plan exactly. for how a, we can a start to plan. Yeah, a bespoke Absolutely. plan um, and a bit of sort of recognition that it is a case of you do have the opportunity and it's a tremendous opportunity yeah. to choose your own adventure. It is. It really is. It I is. think of choose your own adventure. I, I, I think it is and I think part of what we've tried to do in these vlogs and yeah. you know this will be the first of many conversations you and I will have yeah. but yeah. part of what these vlogs are doing mm. is every week just offering a micro minute of something to think about a new skill a new idea one week might not be useful the next week may be and of course this week is crucial for a lot of people thinking through those futures post PhD and you've already mentioned teaching and I didn't know you started as an A-level lecturer as well that's mm. I mean we have a lot of similarities in our career bizarrely uh -huh. people think you're in the sciences, I'm in the humanities, yeah. but actually there's a lot of similarities on the way through. But you are an award-winning teacher as much as an award-winning researcher. What do you see as the relationship between the two? Gosh, for me they're all on a continuum and they're almost, to me, that I, I, I struggle to separate them because even when I think of teaching and, and how much I love teaching, the process of actually teaching in itself for me is a research exercise because I'm constantly grappling with, oh, that bit I think worked, that bit didn't, how will I do that better next time? And this increasing recognition, dare I say, I love, I love teaching and the, and the classroom experience, but realising that actually teaching is a part of, but probably uh, focusing increasingly on the learning yeah, yeah, yeah. and not the teaching. And then when I go to learning, I think, well, research is, is, is learning. That's what we're doing. We're constantly learning. Um, so for me, I struggle to separate it. Um, and in fact, I don't want to. I think it all links together. I love um, in both undergraduate teaching, um, but also postgraduate teaching. I think it's critical to be able to, um, to bring the latest research discoveries um, to your teaching. Yeah. Um, and I, I often think that research is teaching for the world, actually, because when you write a piece of journalism or you write a book, you are teaching beyond an, an analogue space. You actually, you, your words are teaching to the world. So it works, it works both ways, I think. Uh, that's absolutely right. And I'd, I'd, I'd hate to think that, that, and I know that this is not the case in the science that I do and that my students, our team is doing, but, but it's not static. Um, this is constantly changing, it's dynamic. There are new papers coming out almost every minute yeah. of every day. Um, and I think that, you know, A, that's exciting. And so we need to know what others are learning and, and what bits are important and interesting and how we can inject some of that um, into our teaching experiences. Yeah. So for me, it's a, it, it really is very intimately interwoven. Yeah. Um, and more and more so, the more I do it. And I think yeah. that's so powerful because there's a real tendency for researchers, really top-end researchers of which you are, to sort of forget about the undergraduate experience, whereas probably when you and I went through, the great professors were teaching first year. Yeah. And I think we do need to hold on to that commitment of that experience. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I've, um, I've uh, having run the National Groundwater Centre for the last five or six years, I, I'd been almost essentially removed from undergraduate teaching for a while, but I've been back in there this year, and I have to say, and I'm getting goosebumps actually now so just right. talking about so uh, right. like the thrill of walking back into the first year lecture theatre and teaching teaching again was just like truly yeah. uh, incredible yeah, no. and I was like wow isn't it cool that after what nearly 20 years of being in academia that you can still get that much enjoyment out of out of teaching and yeah. um, asking questions and engaging in a dialogue in the lecture yeah. theater it's, it was yeah. it's cool before you and I get upset further <laughs> um, that was lovely and that's yeah. really really important so never disconnect the bits and pieces of your academic and professional life, they do all come together. And that, of course, leads me to the other element or string mm. in your bow. You are, of course, very active in the media, including, I think, your scientist in residence for the advertiser, which yeah. is a tremendous gig. That's living the dream. Uh, what do you believe is the relationship between your media role and your research role? Oh, look, I think it's... Um 
is absolutely critical. And I think that in terms of um, political support, community support, public support, financial support and so forth, um, I think it's necessary and probably highly insufficient to think that all we need to do as researchers is do our research and publish it in a journal. Um, I think it, we've got to have, in my own personal view, strong advocacy and ambassadorial roles. And so I feel really compelled to um, explain the importance of the work that we do, um, the work that we do in groundwater research, um, how it relates to coal seam gas issues, Indeed. water security, mining, uh, the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. It is touching each and every one of our lives yeah. as an issue daily. And it goes well beyond the pages of a journal. Yeah. journal publication um, and so that is a critical um, interaction I yeah. think and I feel com I think scientific communication and research communication are, are, are critical Crit yeah. Abs and science communication is so important do you see that as a public intellectual role because what you've just presented there is a great old-fashioned public intellectual that you're paid by the public purse you're doing this research and teaching but there is that outward responsibility that we have I feel that that is a responsibility um, but I also in addition to that responsibility feel that so many of the big issues that we're debating um, in, 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 in the community right now, whether it's coal seam gas and fracking or the impacts of mining on groundwater, uh, the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and how that works, ensuring enough water for farming and irrigation, enough water for the environment. Yeah. All of these are such profoundly fundamental issues um, that... Um, that require research, but they're also in the firm policy and management yeah. management space. And in many cases, not all, what really is concerning is that many of those issues are are only partly being informed by the best available science. Yes. And I think that there yes. is, I think, as a scientist who loves science, um, you know, um, people say, are you pro uh, this or pro that, pro mining, pro environment. I'm pro science. Yeah. We have to be pro the data, pro so, facts, information, yes. um, and ensuring that information is getting yeah. out there to inform the debate, making sure it's evidence based yes. and scientific. And so I think it's unlikely that that's going to be easily accessible through a journal paper and so therefore writing opinion editorials, yeah. uh, working in the newsroom with editors and journalists I have to say has been a, a totally amazing experience um, <laughs> just being able to go into the newsroom and, and put stories up and uh, you know uh, some of it, some of them are get up and others don't and be able to cope with those sorts of <laughs> disappointments. <laughs> yeah. But it is the challenge of making sure that these conversations are accessible but also that we so. don't lose the complexity on the way through. That's the great balance, isn't oh, it? Oh, and it is a, it, it is not easy and I, I um, yeah, uh, it is a, an absolute ongoing challenge but I feel compelled to try yeah. uh, and give it a shot. And, uh, and the, I, co the country is better because you do? Well, I hope so. Uh, uh, you know, I think there's quite, a, there's a lot of people trying and yeah. I think each and every bit matters. I, I agree with I you. And it is about science education and indeed education more generally for the Australian people so that when we have these public conversations, they are informed conversations. Mm. So important. Yeah, yeah. Now, of course, as you've said, you are the director for the National Centre for Groundwater Research and Training. Here's the wonderful photograph behind us. And this is a, a tough question. We yeah. talked about the complexity of this question. What do you think is the role of research centres like this for PhD students and mm. also for early career researchers. And let me just state, when I went through and did all my career, mm. I was not in a research centre, so I never had an opportunity like this. So we've d both done it different ways. Yeah. Tell us about the research centre experience. Well, look, I think, um, I think that there's so many different ways to complete a PhD, and so um, it's not necessarily a case of one's better or not better. I think they're just different. Um, so in, in the case of our centre, this was born in 2009. It's a co-funded centre um, founded through the Australian Research Council, National Water Commission. Uh, we had about $30 million of, uh, of funding there from ARC and the National Water Commission. And I think that it's not all about money, of course, no. but money does often 
if used wisely, create opportunities does. and open does. doors. And, and when used so, well, too. When used well. So we had opportunities to, um, to, to advertise for postdoctoral fellows and PhD students all around the world. And I recall our first advert went out and we had, I think, over 450 applications for about 40 positions, which set the scene for a pretty awesome. pretty ruthless selection process, but also an amazingly high quality of um, wow. people that were coming in. So, um, but uh, so this, before you know it, so the first year that we had, uh, you know, almost no one there, and I was like, when am I going to see the first PhD student? And, uh, and they eventually started to come oh. from both Australia, but also overseas. And so here was this amazing environment of... Of, uh, of students from all sorts of you know places, different educational backgrounds, different uh, ethnicities, cultural backgrounds, um, coming into the centre, creating this extremely, um, in a way, exhilarating, uh, electrifying environment um, for for ideas and knowledge and and interaction. And so there was people talk about that critical mass, and we felt it. Yeah field are growing to about nearly 80 postdoctoral fellows, nearly about 80 PhD students. and So there's a big group involved across Australia. Uh, but I think before we knew it, the students were uh, creating their own opportunities and, uh, and learning from each other. And uh, it was interesting to see how that all sort of happened osmotically. It yeah. was just naturally self-organising. In most, not all cases, we had the opportunity to bring in well over 100 visiting professors and yeah, scholars no. um, over five years that would come through, um, in many cases, Flinders for sabbaticals, um, sitting in offices next door to PhD students, oh. like the very best scholars in the discipline were here and continue to come. And I think wow. I get excited to be able to, to have them visiting Flinders yeah. and other parts of the National yeah. Groundwater Centre. I think it's been a amazing, um, amazing right. opportunity. It has. Um, on all, on all levels. And I think really. you've appreciated it on the way through. Whenever I talk to colleagues who have had a great research centre like this one is, it's the, the trick is, I think, appreciating it as it's happening on the way through, oh. rather than hindsight being twenty twenty. Yeah. So actually, yeah. you know, it's great That's to say, true. oh, look, you know, in, in 2030, you and I having this conversation, probably still with the blog, going, oh, that was a great research centre. We didn't appreciate it at the time. Uh -huh. This video, I think, captures in real time, we recognise the value of this great place. Oh, and it's not without its challenges. There are so many things as you're, you're building something from, you know, literally sort of sketches in a notebook to making it happen in, in the real world. I mean, I was um, learning a lot and still are yeah. learning, learning a lot. Um, but I think at a very personal level, the opportunity to, um, to be building a centre like that in my 30s and, and stuff. I, I, I wondered if I'd get that chance in a career. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, there's a lot that's been very positive about it. But you did get that chance and you used it when it came. So yeah. that's an incredible experience. And let's talk about groundwater because yeah. I am interested in groundwater. And this was before I met you. There's something like, I'll try and get the stats right. And obviously I've got like the world expert here, so oh. I'll try and get the stats right. One third of our total water consumption in Australia comes from groundwater. And internationally about half of the world's drinking water yeah, comes from water groundwater. Yeah, water for irrigation. Yeah, it's groundwater. So it's a, a massive resource. It, it, and we don't really think about it. So yeah. So the thing is, we've suddenly realised groundwater is everything, and it is so important politically, socially, culturally, it's important mm -hmm. to policy. But what's interesting is you predicted it. As a young man, you were obviously interested in it, but you predicted that as something that was going to go and be successful. So it's a hard thing to do. What would you recommend to our PhD students about predicting the next big thing? Gosh, um, I think it's a really tough one. And is it uh, luck? Is it luck? I, I think that um, so um, certainly as I moved into my PhD, um, I wasn't thinking at that stage. It literally, was what a twenty twenty one year old um, doing starting their PhD. I could not see. I couldn't see the whole career. I couldn't see the centre. I couldn't see any of that at that point. I um, but I did. Th I had a strong feeling that given, um, I just felt that water was obviously an important area for the country, yeah. um, that it's a critical thing. We've seen it through the millennium drought, um, yeah. how critical, 
how critical water has been and um, and and groundwater continues yeah. to be. So I thought, well, this is a yeah, the opportunity to use my engineering and physics and maths and all of the different science, you know, what I think is, and the thought at the time really was a, a really interesting and important um, area to get into was the big step that I was making. And it was, a, it, it felt like a big step. It was like, ooh, I'm get, moving from electrical and electronic engineering and physics, theoretical and experimental yes. physics into groundwater. It took me a while to Powerful. kind of get used Powerful. to the idea that I was making that transition. Yeah. Um, but I now realise, too, the whole lot, I can see so many parallels and, and so forth. But um, I think then once you start to move forward, things start to perhaps fall into place yeah. somewhat serendipitously, yeah. um, a little bit strategically. I think you have to be fairly clear about what you want, yeah. where you want to go, um, yeah. the doors that you want to keep open. Um, and so then there was a case of, well, we started here in 96, 97 um, to build groundwater essentially from scratch, build new topics, new degree programs, um, and things started to, to move forward. One of the moments that was important was in 2006, we're in the height of the millennium drought and a number of colleagues um, decided that it would be important to produce a, a national position paper on groundwater yep, and I was yep. involved to co-author that and we in that preempted that we probably needed some national coordination and national activity and investment in research in groundwater okay. and I got to help with that and that was the door opening there. Wow. Whether we predicted every single problem as it unfolds, in fact I'd say that we, we don't but I think that, um, that we can see some of the big things that are on the horizon. We know now that groundwater is well beyond just uh, the sort of how much water is in an underground aquifer, yeah. how much can I pump? It's all about the links with climate, yes. links with population, links with ecosystems, the broader environment. Managing pollution, yeah. We'd see all of that, and I think one of the great things is, and I've used these journals in my teaching, um, there, are, there have been some fascinating discussions in the literature, in the journal literature, among some of the very best groundwater academics discussing and debating the future of hydrogeology. Now, for me, that's just exciting material to just keep reading and reading and reading and yeah. to inform my own understanding. Yeah. And reading all of that helped to, to inform the way in which we push the centre as it was being yeah. birthed forward. So, uh, and talking to other colleagues and yeah. students, and uh, yeah. this is so much about a cast of thousands. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, mate, and for the guys and gals out there, do you also see how intellectual generosity operates here? It's a phrase I use a great deal, uh -huh. and Craig, you embody it, because it's about saying all of us are a product of these multiple great scholars on the planet, and we learn with and through them every single day. Mm, so, absolutely. very powerful. Well, very gosh, powerful. Um, this, and uh, this is so not about me. Really, it's so much about all of the students, you, all of my PhD students and postdocs. It really, no, I re it really is. Yeah, it's, it's but really also is. it should be about you, and that's why today yeah. is also about you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> la last question, Craig, and I've had a ball. I've learned a lot, and you're just a great human being. I adore you. You know that. Uh, I'm going to finish off with a bit of a downer of a question, and oh, well. it, it, okay. well, um, it is a tough time to be a PhD student, mm -hmm. and is a quite tough time for our universities internationally. So, what would you recommend to our PhD students when they're considering their future research trajectories? Yeah. Now, can I ask you a question? Why, yeah. why do you think it's a really tough time? What are your... Well, again, you and I have had different life experiences. We're yeah. about the same age, but we've had different life experiences. I've moved around a great deal. Uh -huh. you've, you've worked at this wonderful university, you did your PhD here, and you've been able to stay. Mm -hmm. Whereas I suppose I've had to move around the world. I've yeah. seen wonderful things. I've met magnificent people. Yeah. But I've also seen universities in decline, yeah. cities and towns in decline. Yeah. I've seen all sorts of colleagues have very uneven and poor contracts in and out sure. of work, underemployment, casualisation yeah. yeah. of uh, teaching, yeah. uh, really yeah. great people who have been hurt very badly mm -hmm. by some of the management system we're seeing. I've had colleagues kill themselves from bad yeah. management experience. So, you know, there is, and we'll talk about it in other vlogs, but there's yeah. a very dark yeah. side to universities as well, and I think it's mm -hmm. important in some ways we don't mm -hmm. spare our doctoral candidates from some of the inelegances of our profession so yeah. you know but if you think I'm being you know I'm, no. I'm being too negative please say look you well, know, I think that we're moving through it you know a great time I just 
worry for the future sometimes. Yeah, no, no, I agree with everything. And I've seen those things in my own sabbaticals and travels and yeah. working with um, colleagues in all sorts of institutions yeah. around Australia, but internationally. So, yeah, uh, yeah look, look, I agree. And I think that, um, I think that um, it comes down to, I think in some ways, recognising that that some of some of us are going to end up in academic roles at universities, but I do think the data do show it. Perhaps we could do a vlog on this. There's a number of really great reports there are. out there now, and um, and so on. That so many of um, of us that have done and doing PhDs go on to, as we said earlier, just this wide range, this breadth and depth of of jobs, exactly. whether it's in government or consulting, industry, private Huge. sector. Huge. So there's this whole breadth of op op opportunities, really. And um, I continue to be inspired. I, I certainly know there are, there are issues, um, and I've felt them in my own career. But uh, the, the benefits, certainly for me personally, have outweighed by, by so much yeah. the costs and the negatives that, yeah. um, that I remain, um, and I think one should remain. Yeah. It's um, hard sometimes, but yeah. optimistic and yeah. can do yeah. with it. And, and I would en I'd encourage everyone to look at the the, the great things that are out there because yeah. there are so many positive things. Yeah. Um, and I think in many respects the positives. I hope. Yes. Maybe I'm being a bit aspirational no. and ideal, but I think there's so many positive opportunities there out there. Um, that they're there to be had yeah. and I think it's so for me I've always not left things to chance I do think you need to give a bit of thought to what you want how yeah. you're going to get there yeah. get mentors and people around yeah. you to pick people's brains all the time yeah. um, um, get on top of where the opportunities are yeah um, oh, your, uh, your optimism I think helps me a lot Craig and I think what I hope for the pair of us as we know each other through the rest of our yeah. life I hope is that we can create a better future for our students. Yeah. What I want is that the university system that maybe we experienced in the 1990s, the early 1990s, we can bring some of that optimism and joy and stability yeah. back to our students. It's, it's the stability that I want, the sustainability yeah. of higher education that is are, worrying me at the moment. Those are, those are critical issues and I, I, I think that um, in the PhD moment, yeah. And it really is a moment. It, is, I, it right? feels like it's an eternity. I, it felt like it went forever at the time, but it was really three, four years. Uh, and I look back at it now, I think that happened so quickly. Um, and I was thinking, as I was thinking about this interview with, with you, Tara, that, um, wow, just the one thing that I would really say is enjoy it. Oh, yeah. Enjoy it. I know that sounds hard. <laughs> Some days, yeah. but really, the opportunity to to indulge in research and to 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 sort of you know probe things and develop and an original thought. ideas and and you thinking know. and to do it in a way one hopes really without all of the other things that we would be tackling yeah. all the administration and the committees and the team yeah. all the other things. There's an Joy. opportunity to indulge. And, and there's not it. enough moment moment of indulgence in our life, is there? Oh, I think that there, <laughs> we, I, we, there can always be more, <laughs> always be more. But I think that you know, I'm not I'm not saying it won't be like. For yeah. me, it was a bit up and down, and I suspect that there'll be high moments and low moments, and um, for most of us, and yeah. uh, there'll be. Um, I think the other thing that really um, is important is learning about failure. Oh, well I, said. I feel that that's another thing that we're not really um, naturally easily adapted to do with and yeah. I've had to sort of reflect on that over the years and, um, okay. and we've all had them yeah. but the idea that, um, that we constantly succeed I think happens to very 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 few people that you're always successful um, and so I think that in a research sense if you're not failing ever you're not trying. It makes you think, well, either you're extraordinarily lucky, you're <laughs> super lucky, or you're not trying. So I think it's, I think, yeah, feel, feel the failure, learn from it, do the post-mortems, yeah. and learn. grow from that yeah. has been a thing that I've had to con consciously tackle. That, that, that will change people's lives. What you just said there will really change people's lives. And also, use friends around you. You've got your yeah. supervisors, you've got mentors, you've got us 
always use the advice and the circle around you. We will protect you, we will help you, yeah. and help you take that step post failure. Absolutely. That's always challenging. Uh, always here to help. Always here to help. You are. Craig, you're amazing. Well, you're you. amazing. You're very generous. I'm yeah. also very right. Thank you for the time that you've taken today. I think I'm quite emotional, and I think you really have changed a lot of people's lives who have listened to this. And I want to speak on behalf of your colleagues and also doctoral students to say it is a privilege to know you. You are changing this university, but you're also changing the world. Well, and that's what the best of scholars should do. You remain an inspiration for our students and for your peers. So I hope all of you have had a fantastic week. What a great human being. He's at this university. How lucky are we? Thank you, Craig. And as always, have a great week, team. I wish you love. I wish you light. I wish you peace. Tea out with Craig. Yeah. See ya. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That was awesome.